even during his daughter's wedding. I heard it from his own daughter, whom I interviewed when I was writing his biography. His daughter, when he was getting married, Shama Prasad was nowhere to be seen. So when Shama Prasad finally came much later, his daughter, his daughter said, uh, you know, there's a very typical uh, expre Bengali expression, which is called Abhiman, not the same as Hindi Abhiman, uh, which you do with pouted lips and all that. So his daughter said, no, no, you mustn't come anywhere near me. You were, where were you gone during my wedding? What a shame, everybody was asking. Then Dr. Mukherjee said, you are Dr. Shamaprasad Mukherjee's daughter, you must not talk like that. I was feeding some people who had not ate anything for the last, who had not eaten anything for the last 10 or 12 days. You should have seen their faces when I was feeding uh, food to them, I was giving rice to them. So this was the sort of person Dr. Shamaprasad Mukherjee was. <laughs> The topic that I chose today was Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee in the 1940s, because Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee had two phases in his political life. One was in the 1940s, which was a longer one. And the second one was in the 1950s, which lasted less than three years, or last less than four years. And that was the tragic thing after which or as a result of which he had to leave this world as a result of a conspiracy. But that is in the 1950s, we'll talk about it tomorrow. Today, great man that we are talking about, we will begin with the end of 1939, when he first launched himself into politics. You see, 1935, there was an act passed in the British Parliament, which was called the Government of India Act 1935. According to this act, in each province of British India, there would be separate legislatures, there would be votes, uh, people would be allowed to vote, not universal suffrage, but certain categories, and there will be separate Muslim, Christian, Indian, Christian, British, and general different categories. People would be voting in different categories. There was no category for Hindus. Hindus were to vote in general. With Muslims, there was a category. In any case, this thing was launched, or this act was passed in the British Parliament, and in 1937, the first uh, thing was held. First uh, election was held. In this election, in Bengal, there was no, no party got clear majority. Actually, three parties were in the running. There was the Congress, of course, which got the bulk of the Hindu votes, or practically all Hindu votes, Bengali Hindu votes. Bengali Hindus at that time constituted roughly 45% of the population, and the Muslims, 55% of the population, and there was a very small percentage of Christians and Buddhists. So that was the result. Congress got uh, Congress was the first party which got all the Hindu votes. Then there was Muslim League. Muslim League was a avowedly communal party led by Muhammad Ali Jinnah. The local leaders were Suravarti and Nazimuddin. And the third party was a party called the Krishak Praja Party. It was led by A.K. Abul Karim Fazlul Haq. Now, this Fazlul Haq was an interesting character. He was a popular leader, particularly among Muslims. His party did not have a communal agenda. The members of his party, the leaders of his party, they were all Muslims, but they did not have a communal agenda. What they had is an agenda for uh, cultivators, mostly. Most of the cultivators were Muslim. Cultivators for their interest being revoked or reduced and them given uh, different different kinds of sops. So this party not having had a communal agenda 
and Muslim League had been an avowedly communal party, the logical thing for the Congress would have been to align with this party. But for some strange and inexplicable reason, Congress did not align in this party. Actually, Fazlul Haq tried very, very hard to get Congress on his side, but Congress would not budge. And on some very petty point. So as a result of that, this Krishak uh, Purja party was uh, pushed into the lap of the Muslim League and the prevails, the torture of Hindus started in Bengal. In 1937, the, although the two parties, uh, this Krishak Praja party and Muslim League, they joined the government together with Fazlul Haq as chief minister. Muslim League was an all India party and Muslim League leaders had a lot more political acumen. So by and by they swallowed, practically swallowed Fazlul Haq. And what happened is that they started bringing in legislations which were totally inimical to Hindus, which would deprive Hindus of their uh, regular employment, particularly government employment. I just give you one example that in the government, the, this Muslim League, Praja Party, this coalition, they ruled that there would be reservation for Muslims. To what extent? To the extent of 55 to 45. This was still understandable. It's not supportable, but understandable. But what was much worse was that because the Muslims had been backward, which was not the fault of Hindus, because the Muslims had been backward and their representation was much below 55, this government said that we must bring it up to 55. And until we bring it up to 55, no Hindu would be given employment. And uh, in a presidency college, government college in Skaun University, which is the premier college in West Bengal, in presidency college, a post had fallen vacant, a post of professor. The cabinet clearly gave it to, the, to a Muslim who had a third class degree even though they were Hindus with first-class degrees available. This was the situation. The persecution of Hindus, depriving of, uh, of Hindus reached such a level that the Hindu leaders at that time, they wanted prominent Hindu leader to come to the front and give them leadership. And the only person available was Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee. He was not in politics. He was in education. He was at that time with the Calcutta University. He had been the youngest vice chancellor at the age of 33 of Calcutta University. But even so, they decided, all the Hindu leaders decided, among them, there were various people like Ashutosh Lahiri. Nobody would know their names now. Justice Manmotanath Mukherjee, then uh, the uh, head of the Bharat Sevastram Sangh, head and founder of the Bharat Sevastram Sangh, Swami Pranavananda, all these people, they uh, persuaded Dr. Mukherjee to come to politics and Dr. Mukherjee came to politics. And in a short time, less than a year, he persuaded Fazlul Haq to leave the company of the Muslim League. This is a very, uh, this shows the political acumen of Dr. Mukherjee because he had a good relationship, personal relationship with Dr. Mukherjee. Now, as I was saying, Dr. Mukherjee had a relationship earlier with Fazlul Haq, and he managed to draw Fazlul Haq away from the, uh, from the uh, arms of the Muslim League. And he started a new coalition called the Progressive Democratic Coalition. But it was so influenced by Dr. Mukherjee and Fazlul Haq, that it was known as the Shama Haq Ministry. Now, you will very often hear a propaganda by the so-called seculars, communists, uh, the, liber the so-called liberals and the like, they will say that, no, no, Dr. Mukherjee are allied with the Muslim League to form a ministry. This is a total black lie. 
Dr. Mukherjee, in fact, drew Fazlul Haq away from the clutches of the, from the ministry so that they could form a truly secular government. And this was the Shama Haq cabinet that was formed in Bengal. Now, this Shama Haq cabinet came, went, uh, came away from the communal policy of the Muslim League and they started a real proper secular government. And Hindus finally could get some justice from this government. But at that time, the British governor of the state, of the province, was one Harvard, who was a very conspiring person and he, was, he had a great weakness for the Muslim League. For that matter, the central government, Lord Linlithgow, who was the viceroy, he also had a uh, bias towards the Muslims. So this uh, person, this uh, Harbat, he somehow persuaded Dr. Fazlul Haq to resign from this cabinet. Meanwhile, this was, I'm talking about 1941, uh, 1940, yes, 41. At this time, the cabinet collapsed. And there was governor's rule, just like we have president's rule now in India, when the government collapses, we had governor's rule at that time, and then Herbert was governing the province. Then there was this, uh, in 1942, on Durga Puja Ashtami Day, that is on the, in October, there was a terrible cyclone and possibly a tsunami in a place called Kontai in uh, Bengal. It is right now in West Bengal in the East Midnapur district. This cyclone or tsunami, possibly a combination of the two, it absolutely brought hell to the inhabitants of the people, but the Muslim League governor, but the governor advised by the Muslim League ministers, he did not arrange any relief for them. So Dr. Shamaprasad Mukherjee plunged into relief for these people at work. Meanwhile, in 1943, the Great Bengal Famine intervened. During this Great Bengal Famine also, Dr. Shamaprasad Mukherjee did yeoman work. He organized a number of famine relief committees, even during his daughter's wedding. I heard it from his own daughter, whom I interviewed when I was writing his biography. His daughter, when he was getting married, Shama Prasad was nowhere to be seen. So when Shama Prasad finally came much later, his daughter, his daughter said, uh, you know, there's a very typical uh, expre Bengali expression, which is called Abhiman, not the same as Hindi Abhiman, uh, which, uh, which you do with pouted lips and all that. So his daughter said, no, no, you mustn't come anywhere near me. You were, where were you gone during my wedding? What a shame, everybody was asking. Then Dr. Mukherjee said, you are Dr. Shamaprasad Mukherjee's daughter, you must not talk like that. I was feeding some people who had not ate anything for the last, who had not eaten anything for the last 10 or 12 days. You should have seen their faces when I was feeding uh, food to them, I was giving rice to them. So this was the sort of person Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee was. He worked indefatigably, indefatigably through this uh, 1943 famine and thereafter carried on. There was nothing he could do politically. Of course, he was a member of the provincial assembly from the uh, Hindu Mahasabha, but he could do nothing politically because the government was entirely Muslim League. By that time, uh, this Fadrul Haq's Krishak Praja party had almost folded up and it had merged into the Muslim League. So that the entire, Mus entire Muslim support of the state that is 55% of the population went to Muslim League. Well, it went that way and uh, Dr. Shyam Prasad Mukherjee carried on. Then in 1943-44, it went on like that. Meanwhile, the war was raging and there were a lot of draconian legislations which were drawn up under the government of India rules. That kind of thing went on. Finally, in 1945, something very funny happened. 
This is something I got from an ex-police commissioner of Calcutta. He was a he is a relation of mine. He's dead now. His father was a judicial officer. That is, his father was a member of the district judiciary, the West Bengal judiciary. Possibly at that time he was a district judge or something. Now, this gentleman, his name is Nirupam Som. He told me that at that time the officers of Calcutta police, they were mostly Bengali Hindus. This governor, Harbat, Harbat had by that time been replaced by another governor. I think in succession, there were two or three governors, but the running of the state was in the hands of the ICS officers. So when this governor, when this, uh, in around 1945, there was an officer by the name of Niaz Muhammad Khan, who eventually became the cabinet secretary of Pakistan. This Niaz Muhammad Khan, he decided, or he was told by Jinnah, because he was very much under the influence of Jinnah in spite of having been a civil servant. He was instructed by Jinnah to change the composition of the Calcutta police and get the officers replaced by Muslim officers. So that is what he did. He even went all the way to Punjab, undivided Punjab and further on to Northwest Frontier Province, what is known as Khyber Pakhtunkhwa in uh, Pakistan now. And from there, he got Pathan, Punjabi Muslims, to come and work for the Calcutta police. And he transferred all the Bengali officers, Bengali Hindu officers of the police stations to a headquarters where they would really be doing the job of clerks, not much more. And the real power was being wielded by these officers who were in the respective police stations, Thanas. Why did they do it? Because I think a lot of people think it's an educated guess that a number of uh, that uh, Jinnah had already decided that Calcutta was going to be his next theater of action because Bengal was one province which was ruled by the Muslim League practically by the Muslim League, because as I said, the party that the Krishak Praja party had already been folded up. Then he started getting these Punjabi police and uh, Northeast, Northwest Frontier, this Pathan police, getting them to work in the Thanas. And this was the apparently the intention. Then we came to 1945, 1945, the war ended. After the war ended, the Congress leaders who had been imprisoned, they were brought out from the jails. There was a great, there was great public jubilation. And these leaders who were taken out of the jail, they got great advantage. In 1945, there was an election to the Central Assembly, more or less the equivalent of our parliament. In this election, Dr. Mukherjee lost to a non-entity. This is very surprising. He got just a few piddling votes. Why? Because the people were so overwhelmed with the Congress leaders coming out of the jail that they blindly voted for the Congress. So Dr. Mukherjee could do nothing. In fact, at that time, he had suffered a heart attack. And in that condition, he continued he uh, took a sojourn to go to his holiday. They had a family holiday home in a place called Madhupur. He went to Madhupur. He convalesced for some time. In 1946, the British cabinet, the British government changed. 1945 itself, the British government changed. Before that, it was the war cabinet led by Churchill, who was a conservative. Now then, after that, the cabinet changed and the uh, Labour Party came to power, and the leader of the Labour Party, Clement Attlee, who later on became Earl Attlee, he became the Prime Minister of Britain. And Earl Attlee and his cabinet, they decided that now India will have to be given independence. 
There were a lot of other factors behind their, this decision. I'm not going into all of that, but they decided that this was to be done. Now, the problem is there were two warring parties, Congress and Hindu, Congress and uh, Muslim League. The other parties where there were some regional parties, there was this Hindu Mahasabha, there was a Kali Dal, there were other uh, small parties, there was this uh, unionist party in Punjab, undivided Punjab, but they were insignificant. Main parties were Congress and Muslim League. So the British government decided to send a very high power committee called the Cabinet Mission to India in 1946 to decide or to discuss with the Indian parties and find out how exactly India could be given independence. Till that time, there was no talk of partition. People were living reasonably peaceably in all the parts of India, including Bengal, Punjab, Sindh, all parts of India, people were living reasonably peaceably. Then in 1946, when this cabinet mission was discussing, uh, holding talks with the Congress and the Muslim League, they hit upon a plan, which was called the grouping plan. According to this grouping plan, India would remain undivided, but certain things would be done. There would be a weak center, the states or the provinces would have a lot of power, but on the whole, India would remain undivided. Both Congress and Muslim League, they gave their consent to this. But even after that, Nehru, for some strange reason, and this has been recorded by Molana Azad in his autobiography, India Wins Freedom, that Nehru, for some strange reason, he resigned from this decision of the Congress and he said, no, no, we had said so, but uh, we are not going to uh, remain stuck to it. When we go to the Constituent Assembly, we'll consider ourselves completely unfettered by all the, by all uh, previous commitments. Now, Jinnah was in some difficulty within his party as a result of his giving consent to this cabinet mission proposal of grouping. Now, Jinnah got an opportunity and he said that nothing doing, you can't believe this Hindu Congress, we are getting out of it, we also withdraw our uh, consent to the cabinet mission grouping plan. As a result of that, the entire scheme of keeping India undivided collapsed. This is not very well known because thereafter history was written by Nehru acolytes and people who had on whom Nehru had showered um, various kinds of favors. So this great feat of Nehru of resigning from that thing and spoiling the chance of having an undivided India, it collapsed. Then Jinnah said in the same breath that we are going to resort to direct action. We did not clarify what direct action was going to be. This direct action was to be done in Calcutta because the province of Bengal was under the Muslim League. And this direct action, we all know, it was known as the Great Calcutta Killings. And this direct action resulted in deaths of estimated 5,000 to 30,000. Nobody knows the exact figure. But 5,000 to 30,000, both Hindus and Muslims were killed in Calcutta between the dates of 16th and 20th of August, 1946. Unimaginable. The roads of Calcutta ran, run with, ran red with blood. And this was all the doing of this uh, Sarwardi, who was at that time the chief minister of undivided Bengal. And before that, of course, the booming spirit was Nehru, who had resigned from his province, from, his, uh, from the Congress's promise of uh, accepting the cabinet mission plan. So that was that, and nothing could be done. Nehru and Gandhi did not choose to come to Calcutta at that time, because if they came, they would be face to face with certain unpleasant things 
which Gandhi did not want to face, Nehru did not want to face, so that was that. Immediately after this, there is a place called Noakhali right now in Bangladesh. It was then in East Bengal, very inaccessible place, full of swamps and rivers and uh, lowland. In Noakhali, this Noakhali district was roughly 80% Muslim and 20% Hindu. In this district, the 80% Muslims, they started a terrible pogrom against the Hindus. A huge lot of Hindus were killed, women were raped, and there was forcible conversion, great forcible conversion. Now, in those days, the practice in Hindu, in Hindu society was that anybody who was forcibly given a, a feed of beef would not come back to the Hindu fold. And these people, because they were forced to eat beef, usually by killing their own cow, by the Muslim League supporters in uh, Noakhali, these people, they thought that they were out of the Hindu fold. But Shama Prasad Mukherjee at that time did something absolutely revolutionary. And he aligned with Swami Madhavananda of the Ramakrishna mission he took the consent of a large number of pundits and he propagated the rule that any Hindu who has been forcibly fed beef is not going to go out of the Hindu fold. They were Hindus, they are Hindus, they will remain Hindus, and they will be prepared, they will be welcomed into the Hindu fold. They are women who have been raped. They must be married off as early as possible. And there will be no talk of prayaschit. You know, prayaschit is some kind of process by which a person who has sinned, who is, uh, he can come back to the to society. There would be no prayaschit because these people have not committed any sin. They are victims of sin by the Noakali Muslims. So Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee, I consider this to be one of the greatest feats of him because those days, the general uh, atmosphere of Hindu society was such that it was not possible for a Hindu woman who had been raped or a Hindu who had been forcibly fed beef to come back to Hindu society. But Dr. Shaman Prasad Mukherjee and Swami Madhavanan of Ramakrishna Mission, they made it possible. It was a great feat. Then, of course, 46 rolled into 47 and the Governor General of India, who was Lord Wavell at that time, he was replaced by Lord Mountbatten. Mountbatten set a deadline for giving India its uh, independence and started discussing with the Muslim League and Congress. By, the by that time, as a result of Jinnah's Great Calcutta killings and this Noakali Khanate, as a reaction to the Noakali carnage, there was a carnage in Bihar. This was an anti-Muslim carnage. Now, during the Noakali carnage, I'll just show, tell you to what extent these Hindus were, these uh, Congress leaders were biased. During the Noakali carnage, Gandhi visited Noakali. Nehru went with him, didn't say one word. You will not be able to get one word out of Nehru said during the Noakali, except at one point of time, he had told Ramano or Lohia that what does it matter if, I, if this uh, place goes out of India? It doesn't matter. So that was his attitude. But when this um, uh, carnage started in Bihar as a retaliation of the Noakali carnage, then Nehru advocated bombing. Nehru advocated bombing of Bihar, the Hindu villages, bombing the Hindu villages of Bihar to prevent this kind of rioting. Anyway, by 1947 March, the Congress was so demoralized and the leaders were so eager because they could see independence coming and they could see their becoming the heads of the nation. They were so eager to get power that they consented to partition. They consented to partition all this while, which they were what they were trying to avoid. In 1940, Nehru had said partition, demand for partition is fantastic nonsense. Gandhi had said 
that vivisect me, but not India. Same Gandhi, same Nehru, same Patel, they accepted punishment. The important thing is that these people came from states which would not have been affected by partition. Gandhi and Patel came from Gujarat. Gujarat would not be affected by partition. Nehru came from UP, would not be affected by partition. The worst affected states would have been Bengal and Punjab. And Bengal and Punjab were not represented in the Congress. There was Acharya Kriplani, who was from Sindh, but Acharya Kriplani was a very weak man. He was a very good man, a true Gandhian, but he was a very weak man. He could not get one word of, uh, one word of his into the thinking of the Congress. When this thing was decided by the Congress, Hindu Mahasabha had no part to play in it. When this thing was decided by the Congress that they would accept partition and Jinnah would get his Pakistan, then Shama Prasad Mukherjee said that if you are going to divide India, you must also divide Bengal. Why you must divide Bengal? Because otherwise the Hindu Bengalis, 45% population of Hindu Bengalis, they would be forced to live as Zimmis or Dhimmis under Muslim domination, which they will not. Therefore, you must, you must partition Bengal. Now, this was very much resisted by Jinnah. He said this is a move actuated by spite and bitterness. Liaquat Ali also opposed it. Uh, very unfortunate thing is, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose's elder brother, Sarat Chandra Bose, he also opposed it. But Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee, I think this was the greatest achievement of his life. Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee convinced the Congress and traverse the length and breadth of, uh, the, in, uh, of the whole of Bengal to convince people that for the sake of Hindus, we must have partition of Bengal. That is why we have the state of West Bengal. And that is why we, including I personally, as a Bengali Hindu and as a proud citizen, proud citizen of India, I can hold my head high. If this had not been there, then we would have become, whole of Bengal would have become part of East Pakistan. Then we would have all become Pakistani citizens. Thereafter, we would either have to become refugees or get ourselves converted to Islam or jump into the Bay of Bengal. There would not have been any other alternative. Bengalis ought to be eternally grateful to Dr. Shamprasad Mukherjee for this one thing. This, is, this was very much resisted by Bengali Muslims, mind you particularly because at that time, Calcutta was the chief city of India. It, was, it is not like now when the Calcutta has become the sixth city, fifth or sixth city of India. It was the main city, it was the most important city of India, not Delhi, not Bombay, not Madras, but Calcutta. And the loss of Calcutta was very much regretted by the Muslim League. Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who was at that time in the Muslim League and a very energetic member, young member of the Muslim League, he has written an autobiography, an unfinished autobiography in Bengali. In that he has regretted, he has said, Kolkata kano pabona, hame Kolkata kyu nahi milega? Kolkata milna chahiye. He had mentioned this, he had expressed this sentiment. But Dr. Shamprashad Mukherjee managed to do it. Sheikh Mujibur Rahman certainly wasn't saying it out of any kind of compassion for Hindus, but Dr. Shamprashad Mukherjee managed to do it. Congress cooperated with him, and this is why we Bengali Hindus can hold our heads high as citizens of India. Thereafter, upon the recommendation of Gandhi, he was taken into the central cabinet. The central cabinet was formed from 1947 till 1950. He was a member of the Central Cabinet. And during this time in the Central Cabinet, he had done some wonderful things like the founding of the, by, like the Chitranyan uh, locomotive works. He had given shape to the Damodar Valley Corporation. He had uh, founded the Sindri Fertilizer Factory in Bihar. Now it is in Jharkhand a lot of things like that. But this is more or less a summary of his achievements during the 40s. 
the next part of the um, uh, i think this talk is going to be in two parts am i am i right aparna ji this talk is going to be in two parts yes, and sir. in the next part i'll begin from 1950 the beginning of 1950 because something very momentous happened in 1950 which is also not known which has been hidden by this nehru acolyte historians and uh, i am closing right now this is more or less a summary of what dr sham prasad mukherjee achieved during the 1940s thank you very much was there any other major hindu resistance to the british and to the moguls from india because uh, hindu resistance mostly the hindu resistance has been covered up again by the nehru acolyte story absolutely absolutely you see the only hindu party at that time was the hindu mahasabha and uh, the akali dal was a sikh party who were more or less mostly aligned with the hindu hindu mahasabha was led by savarkar but savarkar as a result of long incarceration in andaman jail and thereafter age and suffering otherwise savarkar had become very ill so as a result dr sham prasad mukherjee was the only person who was leading the hindu movement who was looking after the interests of hindus in the country sardar patel while being in the congress sardar patel was very very sympathetic to the cause of the hindus but he could do only as much was possible by him within the fold of the congress that is why he managed that is how he managed to get all the 500 odd native states into india when hyderabad resisted he did police action against nehru's advice if he had not done it if we had listened to nehru then by that time hyderabad would have been hyderabad state would have been a foreign country today but nehru took only one state out of sardar patel's this thing sardar patel's management that is the state of jammu and kashmir and we know that the problem that has been festering for all these years this suppurating wound that we have at the head of india is the doing of pandit jawarlal you had mentioned it was due to mahatma gandhi that he was included in the cabinet from 47 to 50 yes Which And what was his uh, what do you call them? association with other people in the Congress? Was he on the same lines? Because they did support his, uh, uh, they did agree to separation of Bengal. So there must have been quite a number of people who are in support of him. So other than Gandhi, was anybody sympathetic towards him? Yeah, at that time, as far as I have understood the history, most of the leaders they were only looking after their own. states to their own parts of the country there was say for instance bishna das who was looking after odisha then there was uh, rajendra babu who was looking after bihar they were mostly interested in their own part of the country the only person to think for bengal was dr sham prasad mukherjee so there was really no clash of interest there was no other bengali leader who could match up to him eventually one other bengali leader did become a cabinet minister his name was shitish niyogi and he resigned with uh, dr sham prasad mukherjee in 1950 when dr sham prasad mukherjee resigned that uh, thing i will uh, relate tomorrow when i do the second part of the talks but he did not have any issues with any other congress leader sir please tell me i don't know whether they're going to cover it in part 2 but otherwise uh, sham prakash uh, mukherjee's uh, connection with hindu mahasabha how far was it uh, influencing his uh, association with jan sangh or other hindu uh, act hindu yeah, i'll tell you doctor i'll tell you i'll tell you doctor <laughs> shama prasad mukherjee left the hindu mahasabha in 1948 because he had certain disagreements with savarkar and uh, after 1948 dr shamprasad mukherjee was a leader without a party and 
Savarkar, that is, Savarkar had become very ill at that time. He was not capable of giving much uh, leadership. There were other leaders in the Hindu Mahasabha. They worked in parallel, but they were none of them were as prominent as Shamprasad Mukherjee. So as a result of this, Dr. Shamprasad Mukherjee continued like this until he, in 1951, he came in contact with Guruji Golwalkar and they went ahead together to start the Bharatiya Jansang, which was founded in 1951. Were the the states which were most impacted by the partition were Punjab and uh, West Bengal, and uh, Bengal, Bengal. Bengal. And, yeah. and Bengal, yes. Yes. Uh, but the but the only resistance we see has come from Bengal so much, not so much from the Punjabis. They pre-partition. That is not correct. If you visit the Andamans, the uh, Selimar Jail in Andamans, you will find. A uh, list of detainees, people who had imprisoned, been imprisoned in uh, jail. And among them, of course, the largest, by far the largest number are from Bengal. But the second largest are from Punjab. They were this uh, Shahid Bhagat Singh, Sukhdev, Rajguru, uh, then uh, Lala Lajpat Rai, then uh, there were several others. Not all, not all of them were all that prominent, but there were several others who had participated in the this talk. The Punjab also had this uh, communal um, split in the sense that they had three sects as Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs, and their interests were different. Sikhs, uh, apart from Bhagat Singh, they initially they did not participate in the uh, freedom struggle. But later on, in the 1940s, I mentioned the Great Calcutta killings. Great Calcutta killings were stopped by, you know what, not by non-violence or anything, but by counter-violence from Hindus. And in that counter-violence, the uh, principal uh, groups were Bengali Hindus led by one Gopal Pata. So Gopal Pata, his name was Gopal Mukherjee. He, Pata means a goat. He used to run a butcher's shop where they slaughtered goats. So he was known as Gopal Pata, Gopal Goat, so to say. Third and second group was the Bihari Kalwars, the Iron Mongers of Calcutta. And the third group were the Sardars. The Sardars fought very valiantly. It is as a result of their fighting that they, a lot of Hindus were saved. And then after uh, uh, then Master Tara Singh at that time was leading the Akali Dal, and Master Tara Singh was in, uh, he was vacillating from one extreme to another. He could not make up his mind. There were other people like, say, for instance, there was a person called Sir Chotu Ram. There was a party called the Unionist Party, which was led by one Sikandar Hayat Khan, Sir Sikandar Hayat Khan, who was a very secular person. Unfortunately, you... he... Could you please elaborate on these names that you're mentioning, these parties and all? See, I elaborate that will, first thing, that will take a lot of time. And secondly, I have not studied these people in detail. I have particularly studied the uh, place in uh, the situation in Bengal. But I'll tell you in very briefly, this Sir Sikandar Hayat Khan, he was a uh, Punjabi Muslim, but he was a secular person. He did not want any division among Hindu, Sikhs, and uh, Muslims. So he had founded a party he called the Unionist Party. And this Unionist Party was equally represented. It was mostly the party of, uh, party of Punjabi landowners. But they had the support of local, uh, the, even the, uh, the poorer class of Punjabis. Then uh, apart from uh, the Unionist Party, in fact, uh, in the 1930s, Muslim League had very little support in uh, Punjab. Mostly the thing was held by Unionist Party. Unfortunately, Sir Sikandar Hayat Khan died in 1942, and thereafter the situation deteriorated. His, his mantle fell on a person called Khizr Hayat Tiwana. This Khizr Hayat Tiwana tried to give leadership for some time, and uh, then thereafter, he went over to the Muslim League. There's a funny story about it. I'll just tell you 
One said Julus was going in the streets of Lahore before partition. And uh, the Hindu leader at that time was Bhimsen Sachar. And Bhimsen Sachar and uh, this Khizar uh, Hayat uh, they were together. Then uh, Sachar, they were saying, Sachar uh, Khachar, uh, Chore. This person, Khizar Hayat Tiwana, was uh, designated as Khachar. Then suddenly the news came that he had come and uh, joined the Muslim League. Then uh, somebody started in the Jalus, started saying, Ek nai khabar aai hai. So someone said, Ki khabar aai hai? Then they said, Khizar sada paai hai. Then they suddenly changed the whole uh, tune. This is a funny story. This I had heard from a person who, was, who used to live in Lahore at that time and used to follow politics. So all these nuances were there, but it is not quite that Punjab was very far behind. The, the UP had produced a lot of leaders. Punjab had not produced leaders, but they were people. Uh, it is, uh, they were quite a few people there. Bhimsen Sachar was one such person. And this great Bengal famine, Yes. how come it has never been given the, what do you call the, the importance or highlighting which is so necessary, especially in the annals of our freedom struggle. Did it have any effect on the freedom struggle at all? The history of the freedom struggle has been written by Nehru acolytes. And they did not care about Bengal. Nehru had some kind of allergy towards Bengal, particularly towards the Subhash Chandra Bose. And as a result of that, he had asked this, he must have asked these people to whitewash the uh, contribution of Bengal. I'll mention just one thing and then I'll have to take off. See, the British, parla British uh, Prime Minister Clement Attlee, from whom India got independence, he had visited Calcutta in the year 1953 and he stayed at the Raj Bhavan. At that time, the acting governor in Raj Bhavan was one P.V. Chakravarti. This P.V. Chakravarti asked this person, this uh, Clement Attlee, to what, to what was the real thing which caused you to decide to give India independence? Was it the Nehru's uh, wars in Gandhiji's 1942 Quit India movement? To what extent it was instrumental? in giving in the, your decision in giving India independence. Then Atli used to smoke a pipe, you know? He beat on his pipes for some time, and then he said, minimal. That is the contribution of 1942, Quit India movement was minimal. Actually, the Quit India movement was a very ill thought out movement. It was a wrong movement. Baba Sahib Ambedkar had called it an insane movement, insane and irresponsible movement. And the movement petered out. It did nothing for the country. 